Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Diana. Uh, I'm actually uh, not originally from Brooklyn. Um, I grew up in the UK, uh, lived in Australia um, for quite a while, became a citizen and lived there for about eight years. And then I've been living in the States for about seven years now. Um, so a bit of a around the world uh, trip for me. Um, on the internet, I'm known as broccolini. It is spelled exactly like the vegetable here. Um, it's not that interesting of a story, honestly. Uh, so this is an accurate diagram of my career history. Um, I drew it in about three minutes, don't judge me. Uh, so I mentioned I, I've lived in a few places and this has taken me on some interesting journeys um, from working in um, a university, in government, working on environmental initiatives, and then eventually um, making my way to the States. But uh, the important details there are that the first programming language I learned was Visual Basic. So kind of come full circle with uh, now uh, uh, being acquired by Microsoft. Um, clearly no, not many Visual Basic fans in the audience today. <laughs> uh, and um, I've been, I started off in print. I've been working in design long enough to have used Quark Express for anyone that have made, I think he's actually still around. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, and it, uh, there was also Macromedia Freehand, which got acquired by Adobe and then killed. Um, <laughs> and along the way I learned to code and, and then eventually ended up in, in, in design systems. So I work from home. This is gonna be a funny gif of someone dancing with their cat. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, I do have a cat, uh, and I like wearing pajamas, so um, for my team, this is what I am doing before I join meetings with you all. <laughs> uh, and I work from home because I work uh, for GitHub, and, and like Julie said, I am based in, in Brooklyn. And uh, I work on design systems. Um, our whole team is today, Shout, Wave. They're over there. <laughs> uh, and uh, our team has um, been around for about two and a half years. Uh, it started off as a part-time thing, grew into a full-time thing. Um, at some point I became the lead and then last year we um, hired a third person and then I became the manager and this year we hired a, an engineer as well. So we're up to four. And we'll be hiring a fifth person soon if you're interested. Uh, and so I wanted to share some of the things that I've learned through going from like IC into um, management, but also a lot about like the work that we've been doing and um, the kind of like real talk behind design systems. Um, a lot of the mistakes we've made um, and uh, a bit about like imposter syndrome and, um, and sometimes the envy you might feel towards what other teams are doing. And I wanted to start off by talking about um, how you might feel about your documentation site versus these um, kind of like amazing um, public uh, design system documentation sites. So let's start off by having a look at a few examples. So most of you have probably seen uh, material design, uh, probably one of the, the largest design systems out there, at least um, one of the biggest documentation sites. And um, it's, it's really extensive, it's beautifully designed, uh, and they even have like tools for prototyping how material design might look with your application, your, your web apps and your um, Google apps. And they have like things like color tools and stuff like that. It's really extensive. Um, you've probably seen a uh, lightning design system. Um, I think they probably helped um, people become of, uh, aware of the term design system that we all seem to have arrived upon and use now instead of pattern libraries or style guides and all that. Um, and they've got really, really deep documentation as well. And it's also really nicely illustrated and beautiful and really polished. Uh, last year, um, Polaris came out, um, which has incredibly gorgeous illustrations. I love it. Um, but also the content is, is excellent and has great um, uh, examples for how to build stuff um, in React and what it might look like in HTML, like, like guidelines, like principles and accessibility. It's, it's really awesome. 
the government has a design system, uh, US web standards. Um, in fact, Sean and my team um, joined our team for, after working there. And um, it's a bit more utilitarian looking, but still really beautiful. Um, nice, uh, also nice icons and graphics and stuff. Um, really great um, detailed documentation and accessibility guidelines. And then there's Atlassian's design system. I, I figured I should show a kind of competitor, I guess, um, to us, to some of our products. Uh, and um, I'm really interested to see how, how this um, gets used um, more in more across their different applications. And then I would re be remiss if I didn't show you the Microsoft design system, um, uh, Fluent, um, which is great. Um, they have a really nice minimal um, homepage. Um, and, but as you scroll down, they have these um, incredible graphics, and I think that you can build a design system in, in 3D. Um, it's, it's pretty impressive. So looking at all these examples, you might feel like, huh, they're <laughs> Everyone's doing something better than us. These are all amazing. Um, you know, uh, how am I, uh, uh, you know, this is what is expected of me and my team. This is what people expect when they, when they um, look for a design system. And, and it can maybe leave you feeling not so great. Um, and then actually, uh, as it turns out, um, my team went to Stripe yesterday and, and met with um, their design systems team. Um, and uh, Wilson Miner um, kind of coined it really, really well. And he was like, you know, comparing your, your design system to, to these is like, you know, comparing your real life to your Instagram life. Um, you know, <laughs> it's like that, that's like seeing like the best version of everything. It's the curated version of everything. And it's not what we um, in the room might see every day to day working on design systems. Or at least I hope not, otherwise you're just going to think that I'm terrible today when I show you all the problems. So, you know, their, their goals are not your goals necessarily. Um, some of those design systems are, are developer platforms. They're part of selling um, their, their product and, and they want to encourage the developers to build upon that. Um, and we'll hear from Malta a bit more about that um, today, um, who's, who's going to talk about that from Stripe. Um, so you might not have those same um, needs in your team. Um, it means that maybe you don't need to sell it in, same, in the, quite the same way. I still think that there's a lot of internal work that you need to do in pr promoting your design system and gaining adoption. But perhaps like you don't need like amazing, beautiful illustrations in order to ship your style guide. Maybe that's not um, a huge priority for you. So we're going to get into the real talk now. And I'm going to talk to you uh, a bit about the history of um, GitHub style guides. Um, we call our documentation site the style guides. And it's the documentation for our design system. Uh, and I'm, I, I can't go back um, at far, uh, as far as 2011 when I think they started having um, style guides. But I'm going to talk about um, what I've seen in, in the time that I've been working there. So uh, this is um, pretty close to what we had um, as a documentation site when, when I started. Um, and this is sort of kind of public still. It's, it's archived. Um, and uh, this was this was open sourced. Um, our, our code has always been open source for our design system, but our documentation site was public as well. And when our team um, formed, we had to we did a huge overhaul of the design system, and we wanted to bring all that um, that code and documentation together, sort through it, make a big mess, and, and create some order out of that chaos. And so we let this uh, public site um, kind of die for a while, for quite a long time, actually. And um, we resurrected uh, an old um, version of the style guide internally. Um, but the problem was is that it looked kind of like pretty drab. Um, we really just used it to doc because it was like some scaffolding that was already there um, to start documenting the new patterns. But even it, though it had more up-to-date content, um, because it looked kind of drab and outdated and not um, as new as the public version, a lot of people didn't really 
realized that this was like the place to go. Um, we also kept it behind an authentication. So a lot of people um, didn't even know it exist, existed and, and had trouble finding it. So that was a bit of a problem. Um, it was also buried behind like many layers of navigation. You might notice at the top it has um, like the old uh, uh, sort of like GitHub um, header. And there was quite a few like clicks in order to get to the, the CSS style guide. So we tried to fix this with design. Um, we made it a little bit prettier. Uh, we added some useful things like status um, updates uh, the, or the status of the module, um, whether it was a new release or whether it was being deprecated and things like that. Um, we made it easy for people to um, provide feedback. And we made an attempt at improving the navigation. Um, I think we improved some things while we made other things worse. And we were hoping to make it public around that time, and, uh, but we had some problems. Because we'd built it on this um, older technology and because all the code for our design system was living inside the GitHub repo um, that powers github.com, um, there were concerns about security um, because of the way the site was built. It kind of generated the docs on the fly and that also meant that it was incredibly slow. So that didn't feel like we couldn't really make that public. Engineering weren't very happy with that and we weren't really happy with that as an experience. So um, last year, we rebuilt the style guide again um, using Jekyll this time. Um, redesigned it again, because why not? Um, I made some improvements to like the, the navigation and things. Um, here's like some examples of like the inside uh, detail pages. Again, we like um, made sure that it was easy to see the status of things and quickly provide feedback. And around this time, we updated our public site to say, uh, we'll be making the new documentation site public around mid-2017. Well, it's mid-2018. So what happened? <laughs> well, shocker, it actually is public. We just didn't tell anyone. <laughs> And this is actually the first time I'm telling anybody outside of GitHub that this, this site is public and sharing that URL. And, and you, you probably understand why by the end of this talk. Um, and don't worry about writing that down, I'll, I'll tweet about it later. Um, so it has been public for uh, I think about six months now, um, but why didn't we tell anyone about it? Why weren't we proud to tell anyone about it? Well, there were some problems. One, god-awful syntax highlighting. It's embarrassing, really. We're GitHub, we're all about, everyone looks at code on GitHub, yet the syntax highlighting in our, in our style guide is, is, kind, is kind of a mess. We couldn't use that same um, theme that we use on GitHub easily in our Jekyll application. Um, we have lots of it, uh, examples where it's not specifying the right um, language. So this has got some Ruby in it, and so of course the syntax highlighting is kind of messed up. So that's not great. Um, to add to this, we um, uh, in, a, in order to be able to like render like these sort of HTML like examples and like the the buttons um, above, we coded a filter um, that would look at tags in our code to generate this. But this um, broke regular code snippets. And this is my favorite example because it just completely breaks the page. So this is public right now. Have fun looking at that. My team are probably dying in the background <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, this, is, this is cool. This is a popover that you can never, ever close. Um, so you can't see the uh, code behind it. Um, and quick. Quick side tangent, um, so I've, some of you might know I've been talking about color. Uh, I've literally been flying around the world talk, doing talks on color systems. Um, I got back from Hong Kong from the last talk about this um, on Sunday to come here. I'm um, really excited to hear Linda's talk today. Apparently we have many of the same um, sort of themes. Um, so I've been doing this talk and, and telling everyone about all this huge journey I went through working on a color system. And last night where I was uh, sort of uh, poking around like the style guide before I knew we were going to tell people about it today. I looked at our color utilities page and found that all the hex refs are completely incorrect. So that's great. Uh, so that's not embarrassing or anything. Um, <laughs> 
And then we have some really great documentation. Um, you can, you, you, branch names can be a link name or not. They can or, the, or not, it's up to you. Um, <laughs> So that, that's helpful, um, that really really helps you use that component, when's the right time to use it, so um, cool, good job, branch name. And finally, um, our design system Slack channel looks like this at the moment. Um, so um, my awesome uh, boss, um, uh, when we were having trouble with um, people like downloading and trying to um, clone and install and like contribute to our style guide, they were having a lot of problems with um, Node versions and Ruby versions. If you've ever dealt with that stuff, you can probably understand why. Um, and he's a big con containers fan um, and he loves Docker and he was like, hey, I can fix this with Docker. And uh, and, and so um, that seemed like a great idea. We were like, yes, um, but unfortunately, this kind of created a big problem. We've had tons of problems with it, and now it's become a bo bottleneck um, because actually no one on our team is a Docker expert. So maybe don't use technologies that your team doesn't know how to use. So even though we ha know of some of these fixes, we're not able to easily publish updates at the moment. So, so yeah, so we're kind of feeling... Um, a range of emotions uh, about this, from embarrassment to horror to like, oh God, really? Um, to I just don't want to look at this anymore. Um, but you know, despite all of those like bugs and things, um, the large majority of the um, documentation is correct. It is up to date. It is useful, um, and it's definitely far more useful than than what than not having any documentation public. And so to be really, really honest, the real reason that we haven't shared this and talked about it is because we're comparing our documentation site to all those others. And yes, I know I have a typo here. I just thought that worked with the theme. Um, so yeah, <laughs> just keep going. I'm just like, yeah, um, mistakes all over the place. Uh, so yeah, um, th those, um, those, those amazingly beautiful pin polished Instagrams of style guides um, are, are, are not really a healthy measure for success. Um, or they, they shouldn't necessarily be your healthy measure for success and they shouldn't be our healthy measure for success. Um, like I said earlier, they're like the best of. They're like the curated, polished things. Those, those companies have much bigger teams um, in most cases. Um, so um, I wanted to show you all of those problems because I wanted um, you to know that like, maybe the bar, it doesn't have to be that high and maybe it's not a good thing that we're only sharing like the polished, finished things. Um, I think it's important um, for this community to have real talk about the real problems that we always are challenged with and not try and pretend that we, everything's all perfect just because we have beautifully illustrated documentation. Um, Another reason I think it's not a healthy measure for success is because um, I think design systems should be a little bit messy. Um, they should be continuously evolving. They should be driven by changes in your in your product by your product teams. Um, I, I don't think that we will ever be like 100% up to date. Um, so I think that's okay for there to be a little bit of chaos. And certainly working on a web application that's like 10 years old and has had hundreds and hundreds of developers and designers contributing to it, I don't expect that we'll ever have like 100% coverage. And I almost feel like that there would, there would be a signal that something's kind of wrong. It would mean maybe like product isn't moving fast enough or something. So. Um, yeah, so I feel like it's normal for there to be a bit of chaos, and I don't think that we should think um, these design systems should be presented in a in, in perfect, polished, finished state, because they should be able to be changed and worked upon. So what is a healthy measure? I've showed you all the bad things. Um, what, what's, what's good? What should we measure ourselves against? So I like things like this. Uh, we get messages like this posted in our in our Slack channel or direct messages from teammates who are, are telling us things like, um, so this one is a quote from um, uh, uh, my boss and he told us that a team that does not work on product, um, they, they 
built uh, their like security stuff and they built like an internal tool um built a whole a whole new um web application using primer without any help from designers or any help from people that usually work on product um and they did that just by looking at our buggy um primer documentation uh, and because we had also tried to build that, uh, those styles and those components um, in a way that are easy to use and, and mix and match and put together, that help um, people have to make less design decisions. Uh, this, this developer um, thought that this, our design system was the best resource he's ever used in his career. Um, like This is the stuff that helps me know that we're doing a good job and that we're doing the right thing. Um, the fact that our, our product teams just keep publishing and making new features and updating existing features is a sign of success. Um, obviously, our team cannot take credit for all of that, but we know that we're enabling them to move faster, to spend more time on making great experiences, less time writing CSS by having um, a well-documented and well-built design system, even if it's not perfect. We spend a lot of time helping people too. Um, our team does like a, a, a first responder rotation where we make ourselves available to help um, designers and developers that are using our design system or just having trouble with CSS because we're kind of like the, the resident experts. Um, and so we spend a lot of time helping people too. And, and people, and, and I know that that's like something that's um, helping people spend less time like in the weeds struggling with a problem and more time on what they should be doing on the bigger problems, the, the d user experience, the performance of an application, um, whatever. The fact that our team also keeps publishing updates to me is a sign of success and we keep um, continuously involving this. We've done a ton of new releases um, this year and, and I think that's a sign of success. We're evolving the design system like it should be. And the fact that when we publish these releases, we have um, people contributing from outside the design systems team and even outside the company. To me, that's a sign of success. That's an indicator we're doing good things. And then I had to include this one. Um, so the, our soon to be new CEO of Microsoft used Primer to build his uh, personal blog. So that feels like a good sign of success. I just wanted to add that one in there. So those are things that I care about um, and our team cares about. And now I want to talk, um, switch tacks a bit and talk a little bit about you and yourself on like imposter syndrome and some, t some of the things that you might experience as a designer working or, or an engineer working on design systems. Um, so when I think about what, why did I want to work on design systems, what led me to this, why, why was I excited to do this, and why have I been doing this for the last few years, um, it's kind of things like this. Um, I, I had uh, this inclination to try and bring order to chaos before I realized that I needed to live with a bit of chaos as well. Um, I wanted to improve that sort of workflow efficiency, make it easier for people to implement designs. Um, I also had some personal interest. I'm, I kind of enjoy the intersection of design and engineering. Um, I've had many jobs where I've been bucketed into, into design and not allowed to, to touch code. That's ridiculous. Um, if, if I can add value on the code side too, why not let me? And I, I would argue that designers do bring a good mindset to, to engineering. It doesn't mean that we're necessarily better engineers, but we bring a, a different perspective. And, and that can be a good one for sometimes. Um, and obviously, like one of the big reasons is to improve user experience. And um, this is actually really the core reason that made me want to start working on design systems. I, um, my background is in, in user-centric design. I used to uh, do a lot of research and work closely with researchers. And I found increasingly in jobs that I had that I would spend a huge amount of time just dealing with like design debt and trying to like uh, model my way through um, some code and trying to implement designs. And it was like a waste of time. And I saw design systems as a way to, to make that user experience better, more consistent, um, and, and to enable people to spend more time on those important things. But then you start on design systems, and it's like, oh no, this is uh, 
this is not quite as glamorous as I thought it was going to be. This is actually like kind of challenging. Um, there's a lot of things that I didn't expect. Um, and this can kind of give you a good case of like full stack anxiety. So uh, my colleague Joel Khalifa talk, has done some talks about this. And um, I'm not just talking about full stack anxiety in, in the, in the tech, techno, technical sense, but um, it, in many, many areas. And it's gro only grown as I've moved from like IC to lead to, to manager. So as a designer, I'm expected to, uh, that works in design systems, I'm kind of, you know, maybe needing to be good at all of these things. Um, I, you know, I kind of need to be good at UI design because I'm building a design system for UI. Um, but I need to be able to do that with a systems thinking approach. I not only need to think about how a component works in a single page, but how that works um, across different parts of the, the application. I, I need to think about um, brand and like how our brand is represented in, in digital form and how it's reflected in the product. And, and sometimes I might have to be, become an expert in specialist areas like um, color theory um, because I need to think about how do I update this color system to reflect the brand of, of our product. Um, sometimes I need to be a UX researcher. I we always need to get feedback on um, how people are using our design system. And as we grow, like how, how customers directly use that. And then accessibility. Um, I, I'm fortunate that I have some experts on my team and I've had some experience myself, but that's like, it's a lot of stuff to learn and, and be good at in, in, in terms of like applying that to design. In the technical skills side of things, um, I might need to be good at SAS, depending on what your, um, your application is built with. Um, uh, JavaScript, um, that can be a little bit harder for people, I know it is for me, than, than just CSS and SAS. Um, NPM is a whole world of fun. Um, <laughs> People are laughing, so I know you've experienced that. Um, I uh, pulled uh, while um, I uh, last year um, when uh, Roh John Rohan on our, my team was on paternity leave, and before we'd hired um, an another designer. Um, I decided that that would be a great time to um, deal with our NPM issues and pull all our modules that were previously across um, different repositories into one monorepo. And that introduced me to the world of NPM and dependency management and how to handle versioning. And it was a huge learning experience. But maybe I should have done that when there were more people around to help. Um, API, API design is really important. That's what we're all doing all of the time, whether we realize it or not. We're designing an, a, a, an interface that people um, interact with when they're using our design system. Um, when we make decisions about what props to make available to component, or if we're in SAS and use BEM, like when we decide to make something a modifier or, or a new component altogether, that's all um, building the API of your design system. And, and that's a whole thing to be like good at, and it's really important. Um, it's what helps make your design system easy to use. Code review is really important if you do work um, a bit in the code side of building design systems. Um, not only um, is it important to be able to explain why, what you're doing and put that case forward, but you also need to be good at reviewing other people's code. Um, that's part of our job. Um, it's really important. It's a way of collaborating, making sure that we're all heading in the right direction. Um, and sometimes uh, regular expressions are important to you, especially if you want to search through something like 2,449 hex values and find um, the ones that you want to change. So all sorts of things that you may not have thought you needed to know um, working on the code side of design systems. And then there's the management side. These are the things that I've been trying to get better at um, in the last year or so. Um, first off, I have to be excellent at prioritization. We often have like a ton of different competing priorities and different things that are requiring our time. Um, it's, it's interesting because we didn't have a design systems team a few years ago. Now that we have one, um, people are like, for five minutes, they're like really excited about that new thing. And then they're complaining about all the things that are missing five minutes later. <laughs> So um, prioritization is hard um, and, and planning as well, planning ahead, trying to make sure you're building and focusing on things that support the product teams is really important. Hiring, um, 
that's not something that everyone is just born knowing how to do. Um, it, that's a whole skill in itself. Um, and so I've had to learn how to um, attract the right people, have a great hiring process that not only makes sure that we find the, the right person for the job, but the right person for the job finds us too. Um, onboarding, making sure that we um, set people up for success. And I, know, I don't just deal with onboarding for design systems, but also the wider product design org. It's, in it's an integral part of their workflow. That they learn how to use design systems so they can work at GitHub successfully. Coaching and mentoring people, all of us do that at some in some way, but when it becomes to when it comes to people's career development, that's that's got higher stakes. That's really important. And then there's org design. Um, um, as uh, I'm now starting to help with wider parts of the product design org and design operations, and and even if I wasn't, I still needed to think about how does design systems fit into the wider org, um, sell that to um, the leadership, and make sure that um, they understand um, our needs and what's best for for our part of the team. Um, so these are all things that you may not have thought about that you might need to do um, working on design systems. And that can all give you a pretty like big case of imposter syndrome. Um, even though I've been doing this for years and I go around and, and talk about how much um, you know how great design systems are and things, you know, I, I feel this imposter syndrome a lot. Um, and the way I try and um, get over that and feel good about things is is to think um, put things in that kind of this context, you know. We are all learning. Um, so systems design is not really a new part of design. But I think that like the current incarnation is kind of new. Like the vocabulary that we're using, the expectations that we have of design systems, and, and certainly around that expectation of what design and engineering meet. Um, so that's kind of new, and we've got like a ton to learn as an industry. That's why I do things like speak at, at, at these events. Um, I also get to learn from all the other speakers too. That's why I do things like um, running the Design Systems Coalition Meetup because I want other people to um, meet, uh, um, meet other people going through the same experiences that they are. And I think it's important, um, another thing I think that helps is like to celebrate the successes, celebrate the wins, celebrate the ships. You need to celebrate those successes for you and your team to help you feel good and your team feel motivated. Um, remember to thank the, the contributors that um, add new things to your design system. Share that, share that publicly, share it outside your team, um, tweet it if you can. Um, and then celebrate people um, who build new parts of the web application or, or whatever it is you're working on with that new, with that design system. Congratulate them. Um, this is really important, um, and it can help you feel not so worried about all those little bits that are kind of buggy and not quite perfect. And then. Finally, I think like one of the things that we've started to embody as a principle on our team is this idea of incremental correctness. Uh, Guillermo Rauch from Zeit talked about this on our podcast on, on design details um, a few months ago. And I think we've kind of maybe adapted the meaning in our own way. But to us, it means like incrementally correcting things, incrementally getting to um, that, that bigger goal. Um, we're rarely going to be able to tackle 100% of the problems in one go. We're not going to get it all, all right straight up. Um, but as long as we get heading in the right direction, then I think that's good. And we've been embodying this in the way that we work together on our team and how we do our weekly sprints and incrementally um, plan our ships. And um, I was away last week and I asked um, my team yesterday, like, how, how did the last sprint go? And they were like, we killed it. Um, and I was like, oh, cool. And I was like, oh, no, they don't need me anymore. <laughs> Um, but no, I think, I, I mean, I hope maybe it was partly because I wasn't there and interrupting them and asking questions, but maybe it was also partly because we've started to embody this process um, as, as a team and started to see it make success. Um, they shipped their, uh, we've been working on um, a React version of Primer um, lately. Um, we're in the early beta phases of that, but they, um, each week that, that that release has been like shipped slightly earlier and it was slightly more has gotten done gotten done and, and a, at a better quality and we've um we've like got to the same sort of um arrived at the same place in terms of how we've designed those individual components um more harmoniously so i think i think that's that's good that makes me feel happy um so really 
uh, my message is don't worry about those other design systems. Worry about um, what your team is doing. It's not about you versus them. Um, you do you. Uh, as you're going to hear all the amazing talks today, I'm, I'm really um, humbled and honored to, to open for, to, for all the amazing experts that are talking today. Um, you know, listen, let those talks inspire you. But if you don't have the, you know, the, the same size team and things like that, don't worry, team match. Just take those um, lessons, um, learn from them, take that, take that inspiration, and find your own path for your team. Um, because it's about what you and your company needs, not, not everyone else. And so thank you.